in the midst of all of that, in the midst of whatever you face this week, I hope that you are remembering to make time and space for God. It's so important. So important to have that relationship, to ask, to repent, to then allow him to refresh and restore your spirit and your soul so that you feel it, you see it. So as we start this series in August, we're, we're going to look at what the tools are for building. Uh, Jesus loved to use this building, constructing uh, conversation, these metaphors, right? He, he did it a lot. Uh, he, he was obviously a carpenter by trade because of his father. Uh, we could translate that. It's not just wood. Uh, a lot of what they used in, in his time was stone. So there was a lot of stone slash uh, brick slash construction type imagery that he used. And it's easy to use that. It's easy for him to, to, to recall this because when we build something, we start with either a plan or at least a vision. And then when, as it goes, we start to see this, this thing emerge, right? This thing that we've created has been born and birthed, right? So it's easy for us to see what it is and how it got from here to here. In, in Matthew 7, uh, 24 and 27, Jesus uses more of that construction type metaphorical vision when he says, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise. Like a person who builds a house on a solid rock, though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the wind beats against that house, it will not collapse because it's built on the bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rains and floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. In today's text, we see these foundational style, these foundational pieces of tools that we are, are, are wanting and should want in order to keep this this relationship with God together, but then to keep this body of Christ healthy and moving. Paul starts in today's uh, the chapter 4 uh, of Ephesians by telling, by telling Christ followers who they are. We talked about this last week too, though, didn't we? Who are we? We've talked about this now. I think it's three weeks now that we've talked about this. Who are we? We are chosen, we are loved, and we are called. And in this verse, this very first verse, I beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling. If you are loved, if you are chosen and you are called, Paul's now saying, if that is true, then you should lead a life worthy of that calling. You have been called by God. So what does leading a life worthy of God's calling look like, right? Like, oh, that's easy to say, right? Yeah, I'm just going to do good stuff, right? Or I'm just going to be nice. But that's, there's so much depth to what that could be, right? And so we look at tool number one. And tool number one, he finds in, in verse two, that we should always be humble and gentle. We should be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults. Why not start with one of the hardest things to do, right? <laughs> not everybody's perfect. And yet one of the greatest tools in our toolbox of our walk with Christ can be found in our demeanor towards other people. How we choose to treat people, how we choose to feel about people, and how we relate to people is very telling about our current status in relationship to God. So we often find ourselves getting upset, right? We get upset, we get angry, uh, we get uh, selfish, uh, and, and because things aren't working the way we want them to, we get selfish at people, and not just outside the church. Not just outside the church. This is also happening inside the church. Now, patience is not my strongest attribute. My, my, my family will tell you that. My wife will tell you that, definitely. Um, like, and I likened it this way, because I was having a conversation this week with Grady about uh, Madden. Uh, Madden, 
uh, is a, a video game. It's an NFL kind of video game you can play. And all the, all, the, all the players in the NFL have a rating. So all of their attributes and things have a rating. And when you have a 99, that's like the highest rating. So if I was building my own, uh, my own Christian Madden character, patience would not be a 99. Patience would be like a 55, right? And, and, and where, you know, maybe joy would be a little higher. Maybe hope would be a little higher. Maybe, you know, the, the other things might be higher, but, but patience is not my, my forte. And I feel that though Paul packaged these together because of what they all mean together. So being humble and gentle and patient are all of those things in which we give things to each other or provide something for someone else. Patience is not for me. Patience is for someone else. Humility is not for me. Humility is for someone else. Gentleness is the only one that's obvious when we think about it. Gentleness towards someone else, that's gentleness. We often think of humility as being something that we have to do. Well, that's for me. Well, look how humble I am. Wait a minute. <laughs> is that how that works? Look how patient I can be with these people. No, that's not their, their reaction, right? You're doing something so that someone else will see this quality in you. And again, that comes from that relationship with God. I often uh, find myself realizing that not everyone's perfect, including myself. And so I oftentimes get to a place where um, I'm reminded of where I was. 15 years ago, I would not have been standing where I am. I would not have been uh, being, uh, uh, being a pastor, uh, trying to to figure that out. I wasn't even going to church 15 years ago. I had issues with the church. I had problems with the way they treated people. I had, uh, you know, an understanding of, of what I thought it should be. And rather than try to help or do anything about it, I just threw it away. And so I, I have no place and space for judgment when it comes to somebody else. I have to be humble. I have to be gentle, and I have to be patient. Tool number two is from verse three. It says, make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourselves together in peace or with peace. United in the spirit. Wow. If there was ever a cultural moment where we as human beings, let alone Americans, needed to try to come together and be united, man, it's now. I mean, even church. You look at the Methodist church. The Methodist church is split and divided and against each other, let alone America, which who knows what schizophrenic America you're going to wake up to tomorrow morning when you turn the news on, right? And it's all designed to keep things ununited and separated so that it's easier to manipulate and control. All of it. The best thing that I've done probably over the years is to basically shut those things out. Right? Everybody says, well, you've got to know. It's the Methodist church. You've got to know what's happening. I go, no, I don't. They don't, they don't, they don't write my check. They, they approve my license once a year. That's about it. The rest of it comes from you. Whether it's, whether it's the, 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 the paying for the health insurance, whether it's the paying of a salary, whether it's being there for my family, that's coming from you. That's not from them. There's an individual relationship here, and we want to make it something corporately huge, but it's not. It's irrelevant. You know what would happen tomorrow if, if we wake up and, the, and they say, oh, well, well, the Methodist church is just going to split. Guess what? We're still going to be here. We're still going to worship. And we're still going to be helping people in our community, regardless of what that is, right? United in spirit. That is something that is so deep and yet something that we just often cast aside. Make every effort is what Paul says. Staying in it together and being peaceful with each other. There is this great benefit to utilizing this tool 
that you can build a relationship with someone and possibly even love someone like Jesus in the process. You can do those things together. Peace is important, but we often forget that there's also accountability involved in that peace because we can't just let things run rampant. And so there is a structure, there is an accountability piece to this, but if we are united in this, in the spirit, then we will see each other's humility, gentleness, and kindness, right? And peace will be a byproduct of what we're united to do. We're going to be focused on spirit and, and kingdom work, not on what's happening or what color the sky is today. We are focused on each other and helping and caring. And tool number three comes from verse four. And he says, there is one body and one spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. Now, if there is, in fact, and, and I don't need to see a, rate, a show of hands, but if there is, in fact, one body and one spirit, and we believe this, there is also a fact that you, all of you, have been called to one glorious hope and future. And you're like, well, how's that a tool, right? How many of us come here on a Sunday morning or watch online and we recite the Apostles' Creed? Okay, so are you just saying words because they're on a screen? Or is that something that you believe? Because if it is, you're saying that you believe in the resurrection of the body and life everlasting. That's our glorious hope. And if we are together in this, then there is one body and one spirit that is providing that glorious hope and future. How many of us know the destination of our, our souls? I don't know about you, but when I, want to, when I wake up tomorrow morning, I want God to speak into me. Hey, whatever you're going to face today, it's okay. Because it's temporary. And I know of this hope, and I know of this place, and I know where we're going, and this isn't it. So whatever you're facing today, it's going to be okay. There's more coming. There's more joy. There's more hope. Now, there is a lot to say here in the middle of this, this text, right? I can go into to great, you know, I don't know if we have another hour or not, but you could go into a lot more text in the middle of it. Because it's talking about what we are and how we're gifted, how we're to be equipped. And, and, and again, that's part of my job is to help equip you for this work. And then we find out that we all have a part to play. We all have a gift. We've all been blessed with something. We all have something useful that someone else needs. We may not see it. We may not know it. But there is. We each are a unique tool in God's tool belt. And we're designed for something specific. Not necessarily an occupation. I'm talking more about what your talents are outside of an occupation. Couldn't be the same thing. But if we get to verses 15 and 16, we find tool number four. And he says, instead... We will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ. That's kind of the goal. Who is the head of the body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. And as each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. We have the choice and the ability to let Christ lead the church. Now that does not necessarily mean Maplewood United Methodist Church. That does not necessarily mean just the people you can turn around and look at and see in this room. The church is every believer and follower of Christ. Every one of them. Now they may not be in this building. They may not do the things that we do, but that doesn't mean they don't exist or that we should work in conjunction with them. When we allow Jesus to lead, he sees to it that each part begins to fit perfectly. That's us allowing him to lead and us getting out of the way. 
There is a key point in which Jesus says here, as each part does its own special work. Again, back to your special gifts and talents and what he's calling you to do. Each one of us has something. Something somewhere that he's calling us to. When we pray over our offering every week, we pray that we can give back to God what is already his. And that's our money, our time, our energy, our talents, and our gifts. When we take vows of membership to the church, we tell them we are making ourselves available to the service of our church. When we are participants, the church changes. However, if we are unwilling and we are sitting on the sidelines, why on earth do we wonder why the church is not growing or moving? Now imagine for a moment, uh, your, your, uh, your talent or your gift, your ability is a hammer, right? A hammer is good at driving nails, right? Or pulling them out, right? Hammering nails, driving nails, putting things together, right? Now imagine... You are the best hammer the world has ever seen. You have the ability to drive nails faster than anybody, deeper than anybody, stronger than anybody. And yet what you do on a daily and weekly basis is you sit yourself on a shelf like this sanitizer and you go, okay, hammer. Hammer's not doing a lot of hammering. But he's the best hammer there is. I promise. But it's not doing a lot of hammering right now. We can't expect God to magically lift the hammer and use the hammer for its intended use. The hammer is meant to be used in order to drive a nail, right? And so we have to get this into our system that, man, God's called me to something. He's called me to use these tools. He's called me to build my faith. He's called me to something. And when, and when we are willing to, to, to allow God to utilize the gifts that he's given us, he then makes us fit perfectly into this body of Christ. And it doesn't always feel like it's perfectly because that's us, right? Sometimes it feels clunky. Sometimes it feels like... You're trying to get that, that, that video screen to work 13 times this morning, right? <laughs> but he knows that this life will work better and you'll fit more perfectly in it when you're willing to use the tools that he has provided. Faith is not a, a word. It's not a, a pronoun and a noun or an adjective. Faith is a verb. Your relationship with God requires action. It requires something of you. It, requi it requires repentance. It requires forgiving yourself and others. It requires us to activate and use the hammer. Right? Hopefully, he knows that we can build a better community with his leading, with his focus, with him taking charge and us allowing him to use us, if we're that good hammer, right? Use us to hammer things. If we're a screwdriver, allow us to be a screwdriver. If we're a drill, allow us to be a drill. But it's up to us to activate those tools and to use them in service. Can we build that faith together? I hope so. Can we look like the church that to the world around us that, that we see, they see something building, they see something growing, they see something moving, and they want to be a part of that? I hope, I pray that we can begin using the tools that God's given us. Amen.